Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Jonathan Bodoing. Uh, welcome to the Chimera 1.3 webinar. Uh, I'm hosting today along with Duncan Malice, who's helping me from the UK. And uh, we'll just get started. Uh, so we'll do a couple of PowerPoint slides first. Uh, we're going to be very light on the slides. It's a software demo. Uh, it's a software company. We sell software, so we want to spend time looking at our software, not a PowerPoint. Like I said myself, uh, I'm hosting. I'm the chief scientist uh, by night and product manager of Chimera by day. And Duncan Malice is the head of business development. Has done a lot of webinars before, so he's helping me out a lot behind the scenes. He's going to be taking your questions if you have any, uh, and then we'll be queuing them up, and we'll make a few breaks uh, as we get through the various uh, acts of this. Uh, and we'll pause frequently to answer them. So if you have questions, put them in the GoToWebinar interface, and Duncan will uh, answer them if he can directly, or if we want to tackle them more widely, we'll, we'll get to them shortly. Uh, the contents today is basically we're going to cover the themes that we're uh, that are in the 1.3 release. There's four themes. This is the way we plan our development. Uh, theme one and two are the big uh, meteor items that we're covering today. Themes three and four we'll be uh, touching on in the release notes if you like, uh, but we won't be really covering those today just for time. Uh, the filter toolbar and the slice editor improvements are the big things. Uh, that was the focus of our release and the focus. That's why we're focusing it on here. Uh, we've made a release note available as a handout in the GoToWebinar interface. So if you hunt around in there, you'll be able to find that. There's a PDF you can download and skim through or read after the fact. And that basically gives you an awful lot of details. We put a lot of effort to make that very uh, detailed and extensive, almost to the point where it's, it could serve as a bit of a training document to get people up and running with the new features. If you're an existing client, you can visit www.qps.nl and click on Chimera in the download section to get the new release. If you're not a client yet, you can go to the same website and click in the evaluate section and click on Chimera and you'll fill out a little web form and then someone from the sales and marketing team will get in touch with you to give you instructions on how to download an evaluation version and uh, ask information about getting a license for you. So I'll just quickly skim through the, the points. Uh, theme one is a filter toolbar. This is the second phase of our cloud replacement for QPS clients. That's a familiar word for people new to QPS. Uh, cloud is a point editing software that's been shipping with the Quincy suite for quite a while. And we've been working with Chimera to phase that capability into Chimera. Phase one was uh, with the 1.2 release in March. Uh, this release yesterday is phase two to bring all the automated filters into Chimera that were in cloud. And really, that was a lot of the capability that the cloud users wanted. Uh, we put a bit of a transition guide in the release notes. If you are a cloud user, have a look in the release notes. There's a table of contents. It's tucked away at the very bottom. There's an FAQ plus a couple of tables that help you figure out. You know, We've renamed a few things. Uh, it helps you transition from cloud to Chimera. Uh, and the good news is with this release, the majority of the cloud capability is now offered in Chimera. Uh, we can run the filters from the toolbar. You can run filters inside and outside areas. You can run them from the slice editor. You can make your own custom filters. Uh, and to help cloud users transition, you can import your existing QTM files or pre-existing custom filters. And now you'll find with this release that the ENCs, or what we call QNCs, are now fully supported and more consistent with the other QPS apps. So this is a look here. On the lower left, you've got a screenshot of cloud looking at a data set. This is the data set we'll be looking at today. Uh, that same data set loaded in Chimera, you can see that we've got the similar look and feel brought to cloud users as a slice header in the lower right hand, uh, and then an overview map in the upper, sorry, lower left, and then a 3D map in the upper right, uh, and then the cloud toolbars, move my mouse, all of these toolbars that gave you quick access to capability in cloud have brought, been brought into Chimera, and here they are. So we're covering that today. Theme two, uh, slice editor improvements. Uh, slice editor was the big feature we released with 1.2 in March. We've added some capability to it based on user feedback and then plus bit, bits and pieces that were missing from the cloud uh, replacement uh, phase one. Uh, so I won't get into these. I'm not going to read them out. Uh, we'll be touching on pretty much all of these in the demos once I get to them. Theme three, uh, we did some SVP improvements largely driven by uh, customer requests, uh, importing a couple of new formats. Uh, being able to enter SVP position in grid coordinates instead of geographic. And you can quickly see the date, time, and position of the SVP file in the properties window now. Uh, and then it's just a couple of tweaks to how SVPs can be edited in the SVP editor. And we won't be touching on this today, but those are covered in the release notes in more detail. And theme four is a, a bucket of feature requests and client requests that we've had. Uh, I'm not going to read through all these just to save time. Uh, these are all listed in the release notes and explained as well. 
So with that, let's get to a demo. So I'm going to start Chimera. And the usual welcome screen comes up. And what I'm going to show is opening up a Quincy project. So if you are a QPS client and you use Quincy, we've made a big effort to make it extremely easy and fast to open up a Quincy project. So here's a Quincy project. Quincy does the acquisition and georeferencing in real time, and it can build a grid. And when you come to Chimera, you can say, I would just like to trust Quincy's results and get straight to point cleaning. If you have some sonar processing you'd like to do, uh, you can also do that. So this gives you that opportunity to make that decision. If you've done your integration well in Quincy and you trust the results, you say just point cleaning, and that quickly loads up the data set here. So there are the QPDs, so the QPS results files, uh, the sounding results, and then the grid that was computed in uh, Quincy in real time. This is a dynamic surface, and so what I'll do is I'll just get straight to work showing off some of the capability. So I'm going to switch to 3D mode and just zoom in a little bit here to this area. And you'll see that there's a bunch of spikes. And what we're going to do is just get to the point where we need to kill dots. So what I'm going to do is retail the, uh, the look and feel of the, the grid to give me the best view uh, for spike killing. In this case, we're going to color this uh, by standard deviation here. And this makes the spikes pop out a bit more. And I'm going to choose a color map that really highlights the, uh, the spikes. Uh, the Midwater color map that we use in our FM Midwater product it does a really good job. It's got nice gentle blues transitioning into greens. And when things get big and worrisome, they turn red, which is what we want. We want our eye to be drawn to the red spikes. And what I'll do is adjust the color map range. There's a histogram. 0 to 16 is the standard deviation. We're just going to stretch everything. From 0 to 0.5, click OK. And now I get a lot of red ugly pimples wherever there are spikes. And so I've got all my data ready to go. I'm going to start cleaning. So let's start showing off some of the new capability. What I can do is use the standard spatial selections tools. So here I've got a freehand select, so I can just draw a lasso tool. I can lasso around that. When I come to the new filter toolbar, here it is up here. I'm going to choose a medium spline. I want to apply this to the files that went into building this surface. And I'd like to apply it inside the selection. And I just click the button, and that's gone. I can come over here and draw another one, click the same button, and that's gone. And just to be very clear, this is not filtering the grid. We're using the grid as a window into the result of our data. When I select this area, it's loading the points and it's filtering the points using a spline filter and then updating the grid. We're not actually filtering the grid or modifying the grid. The grid is just showing the result of the filtering operation. <clears throat> so again, that's just the last two select. This works for, with any of the select modes. I can choose that and kill my dots. I come back here to the last two select. I can apply that. So this is uh, what I'm going to do is slowly paint the, uh, this, the story of how you can make this more and more streamlined. So I can middle click at any point to reposition the scene to where I want. This is the standard flader mouse visualization uh, mode. And then if I hold down the shift button, I can left click to spin it around and get a better view. So shift and then I left click. What I can do is now let go of the shift and oopsie, select that and filter it. This will be a little tedious if I look at the size of the whole data set. I really don't want to be doing this over and over by hand. So let's streamline a little bit. What we've added is, uh, based on the cloud users requesting, is if I hold on the Alt key and then I middle click, I can reposition my selection to exactly where I want it to be. So I hold down Alt and I middle cl left click to reposition. Alt, left click, Alt, left click. And that allows me to hop around from spike to spike to spike. And, uh, oopsie, and I'll just filter that again. And so now I can quickly hop around, Alt, Spike, Filter, Alt, Spike, Filter. And this is a little bit, when you work in this mode, it's a little bit like putting out a fire. You want to put your fire extinguisher at the base of the fire. So think of the red spikes as a fire. When I point there and I hold Alt and click, it's going to park it centered on that spike. It's a little tougher to work in 3D sometimes. 
It's easier to work also in other ways. So we can kill those spikes all we like. Uh, and that's a bit of a manual mode. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can speed this up. Um, just to give you a window of what's going on, I'm going to come to another spike here. And what we'll do is launch the slice editor now. And I can do that with this button up here. Launch the slice editor, or I can hit the number 2 as a shortcut. Click that. And now all the soundings associated with that little selection are loaded up in the slice editor view down there. And so I've got some, some bad soundings popping up, and that's what's causing the grid to have an artifact. So what we can do now, just like in cloud, is if I have a filter loaded up, I can apply that filter in the slice editor. But before we do that, let's just quickly, I'm going to click on this button here, and I can make the dots in this display very, very large. When I'm spike hunting and I want to kill dots, I want to see the dots. If I make them very, very fine, that's nice when you're looking at a wreck and you want to see details. Uh, but when you want to kill dots, you want the dots to be nice and big and juicy. And I can do the same for the scene as well. That's the second control. So I left click and hold that down and you get this menu and you can change the dot size. You can also just click it once and it'll increase it. So let's just make it extra large. So now that I've got those points loaded in the slice editor, I can click the spike filter and it does with the job. And I see the actual points that, uh, that are uh, filtered away. And now I can get back to the business of I hit save here. And now we'll update the grid and that spike will be gone. I click here, Alt, again, Alt and left click. I load that data and click the spike filter. It's gone. Alt and left click. I pop over there, but it's saying, hey, you made some edits. Do you want to save them? I say yes. And so I'm trying to speed this up. I want to kill my spike, and then I want to move over here. And I keep getting this question popping up, which, you know, admittedly can get a little annoying. Luckily, there's a control for that. If I go over here to the additional features menu, to the very upper right side of the slice editor. I click on that, and you can see up at the very top that there's three different save modes. What we have set at is save edits manually. Now when I edit things and I move around, it'll prompt to say, do you want to save? Or at any point, I can hit the save icon. If I switch to save edits automatically, it's going to give me a warning saying, hey, whenever you move the polygon, it's going to automatically save your edits. Is that OK? And I can say, don't show me this message again. That's OK. I'm, I'm, that's perfectly fine by me. That's what I want. So now when I hit Apply, the spike is filtered. And when I click Alt and then left click to position over here, it's automatically saved for me and applied. And I can continue hopping around and killing spikes. And maybe that's not even fast enough. Maybe you want immediate feedback. What you can do is save it to save edits instantly. And what that does, I'll show you quickly if I switch into dot killing mode, is if I kill some dots, and as soon as I let go, the grid is updated. If I kill this dot, the grid will be updated. Let's kill a couple of these, and they're gone from the scene. And the spike is getting smaller every time I kill some of the dots. What this is nice for now is I can click the filter button and it's automatically applied. I come here, I click the filter button, it's automatically applied. Click the filter button, it's automatically applied. And the grid is updating before my eyes. And I can make that even faster. When I hop around, there's another option under the additional features menu is to automatically apply the active filter. And what that means is whatever filter you have chosen up here is going to be applied whenever you draw a polygon. So if I do this, now when I hop to a spike, it's going to apply the filter and update the grid instantly. And let's just turn off the view of the points in the scene, and I can see that a little bit better. So here's a spike. I'm going to Alt and then left click position there. The spike's gone. Do it again. The spike is gone. I do it again. The spike is gone. So this is as streamlined as you can make it. And this is great for smaller data sets that are responsive. When you've got data that's on your local drive, you can quickly get that immediate feedback. You're killing dots in an automated way with a filter. And the grid's updating with that result right in front of you. So basically, you can walk around and scrub, scrub, scrub to your heart's content if you need to. 
this gets a little tedious at the end. There's a lot of spikes to kill, and as much as I'm sure you're enjoying me, enjoying watching me kill dots, uh, there has to be a better way, and there is. What we can do is um, let's take the big view outside and get out of slice edit mode. What we can do is apply those filters on a larger basis to the entire data set or subsets out of, of it if we like. And so what I'll do now is first uh, sort of switch back to 3D. So there's where I've manually cleaned some of the dots already. What I'm going to do is go to the filters menu and I'm going to choose to revert all filtering. I want to undo all of that filtering I had done and I want it to happen everywhere, everywhere in the surface. And I click go and what we'll see that's running down there is that the grid will update and all those spikes that I had killed in a semi-automated manner, hopping around, are going to come back. So we're back to the base state where we started. There's all the ugly spikes. And what I'm going to do now is let's clean a bunch of them, but I'll show off another neat tool. Is What I'm going to do is uh, I want to kill all the spikes in the areas where it's mostly flat, but this particular bit of seabed infrastructure I want to protect from being having the filter run. So what I'll do is go to the lasso selection mode, and I'll draw just a lasso around this, just coarsely, to capture the shape of it. This is an area where there's real things going on, and I don't want to despike uh, if at all, or if I do, I want it to be very, very weak. And what I'm going to do is choose a medium spline filter, so medium strength. And then from this menu, I'm going to say, I want to filter outside of that selection. So basically, I've drawn a polygon, and I'm protecting everything in there against the filter. Meanwhile, everything outside is going to be filtered. So I click go. And this is about two to three hours of survey data. Uh, the filter takes about 20 to 30 seconds to run on the whole surface. And there it goes there. And what I'll do is I'll just pop into 3D again. And we'll see, once that's done, we'll see that all of these spikes outside of the polygon are gone. And then everything that's inside this polygon remains safe. So this is a way if you have you know, targets of significance, you can protect them. Uh, if we had just a big, floor, boring, flat area, you could just apply the filter globally. There we go. All the spikes are automatically removed outside of there. Meanwhile, everything inside this polygon has been protected. So what I'll do now is let's show off some of the custom uh, toolbars, the custom filters we can build. Let's, let's do some cleaning inside here, but not manually. What we'll do is if I go to the toolbar, there's a, a Manage Filter Profiles button on the far left. And this is a direct capability from cloud. You can make your own custom profiles. So I'm going to make a new one called My Profile. Click OK. And you can add a whole sequence of filtering operations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some really quickly. I'm going to filter above a height. I know from, from there's nothing shallower than minus 5. There shouldn't be, and if there is, it should be filtered. I want to filter below a height. Uh, I think the lowest depth we'll see is minus 25. And then, uh, because I know that a lot of these noisy beams come from the outer beams, what I'm going to do is choose to filter specific beams. And when I click on these, the, the right-hand panel shows a lot of details and information about this, so you don't have to run to the user's manual to figure out what they do. So I'll filter specific beams. In this case, you put a comma-separated range, so 0 to 19, comma, and 236 to 256. Hit Enter. And in this area, because I'm a little more sensitive to I don't want my features to get filtered away, I'm going to add a, a spline filter, one of the preset ones. And there's a lot of information about what, those, what the spline filter does and how it works there, if you want to read up on it. I'm going to add one, and I'm going to choose the very weak filter. We've renamed the spline filters. They work exactly as the same as they did in cloud. Uh, we have the former names listed here. So if you're looking for a specific spline filter that you used to use if you're a cloud user, you can find that there. That's also in the, the release notes in the cloud user's transition guide. So there, I've created my custom filter. I'm going to filter above a height, below a height. I'm going to clip some outer beams. And then after that's all done, I'm going to do a spline filter, a very weak spline filter. And these are applied sequentially. So when I click OK, that's now available from the list of pre-built-in filters. There's my profile. And what I want to do is I'm going to apply that inside this spatial selection right here. And I click Apply. So the job is going to run here. And that's passing through all of the QPDs and running all of those operations. And what we'll see is that 
a lot of these rocks and lumps and bumps that are behind this particular bit of seep structure will stay there, and the spikes along there are gone now. So there, we've quickly de-spiked outside of that polygon very aggressively, or maybe not very aggressively, somewhat aggressively with a medium spike filter, and then inside we created a custom profile which was here, filtering above a height, below a height, clipping out some beams, and then doing a, a weak spline filter. And so if it wasn't for me talking, this whole operation would take about a minute or two, and you'd have a very clean surface. And because this came from Quincy, you've got the real-time integration of your QPDs. Your, your soundings are already geo-referenced, and you've got the dynamic surf, surface built for you online. So you're you know, off the boat and straight to work. You know, Two to three hours of survey data is cleaned in a matter of a minute or two. Uh, and that's it for this particular part, and so maybe I'll take a break for questions here and see if Duncan's got anything for us. Uh, we've got one question, JB, um, to cover, which is, uh, it was how to ensure you're not removing too much data on the steep slopes or to, to you know, make sure you're not taking the tops off the sand waves. Uh, I answered quickly about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, using the 3D, the slice editor as a preview, but you might want to you know, sure. cover how you can change things and, uh, and update it. Let's look at that real quick then. I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll grab just a little rectangular selection in the middle here where there were some spikes, if I recall. And what I'll do is revert my filtering in there and bring those spikes back. I assume there's some spikes in there. Yes, there are. Okay, so Let's load this up in the slice editor. It's a great preview tool. It's a window into your data. And what I can see is all of my soundings there. And what I can do is switch to the medium spline. And I'll just make sure my save mode is a little more friendly. I'm going to turn off save at it instantly. I'm going to set it to manually. So it's, I'm just playing around. What I can do is apply that filter in here and see what goes away. I can undo that and redo it to my heart's content. It's a little tough to see uh, when you have these big outliers, so what I'll do is zoom in and maybe make the point size a little smaller so we can see some of the sand wave, see the, the features here. I can see the sand waves on the lower edge of the soundings. And so if I redo my filter and undo it, you can see that the spline is taking away the outliers up here, but the detail is being preserved here. And this is going to be something that you'll have to get comfortable with. This is a way you can do it. You, you convince yourself that it's doing what you want it to do. Uh, and really spend a bit of time getting to learn how the filter strengths and weaknesses and then decide for yourself. You can do that with the, with the slice editor. At any point, you can just undo it by reverting the filtering. And just like I did with this demo, uh, that's basically what I was doing with, this, with the slice editor open and the spike hunting was convincing myself that I was indeed just taking away spikes and not the detailed features. And because when I hit save here, when I apply that, let's look in the grid. This is the end result. If you look at the size and shape of these sand waves here, when I hit save, that's going to de-spike it. That size and shape, they're all still there. And if I get out of the slice editor mode and I look at this relative to the other areas, I really don't see any textural difference between this area where I did filter and this here. So those are a couple ways you can get that confidence that it's taking away the outliers without destroying anything that you actually might be interested in. So that's a good question. Anything else, Duncan? Uh, one more on um, uh, if you were in process point mode bringing it in, can you go back and uh, do some raw sonar processing if you um, if you finally got a problem? Uh, you can. So if, if you're a Quincy user, it's extremely easy if you trust the Quincy on-time integration, online integration, and the grid, and you're happy with the results. With this particular data set, that was true, uh, and we were able to get right to the point editing. If you do need to uh, do some sonar processing, and what that would mean is applying a tide uh, or maybe changing the SVP, you can click on any of your QPD files and right-click and say load associated DB file. And what that's going to do is it'll warn you about particular systems that Chimera doesn't support quite yet. It migrates that file into the raw sonar files section. And now you have capability. I can go to the time series editor. Let's say I look at the height. You know, I could edit the height if there was a spike. 
Uh, I could look at the SVP profile, for example, and I could bring other SVPs in, or I could edit a spike in here, whatever. And that would reprocess. Maybe I'll just do that real quickly. Let's say I edit this, I hit save, close this. Now this file is marked as dirty. That little icon means it needs to get updated. And I get prompted, would you like to reprocess this? I say, yes, I would. And it'll reprocess this. Meanwhile, the surface is acutely aware that that file has been moved. It's still got that bookkeeping that lets you update that particular surface uh, file. And if I go back to this and let's just undo what I did, I can do that either. I click and hold that. I can accept inside my rectangle and bring that back. So I'm just going to undo my silly edit hit save and close. That file is marked as needing reprocessing. Again, I click yes, yes, please reprocess it. And then it updates the grid. So you can do that with one file or all of your files. When you bring files in for raw sonar processing, it takes a little bit longer time because you have to strip out all of the raw sensor information into the format that Chimera uses that's standard across all of the file formats, whether it's Quincy or Kongsberg or Reson or HiPack. All right, I think I think we've covered that question. Uh, anything else, Duncan? I think we're probably running out of time for questions, so we should probably move on. Yeah, no, that's okay. No, we can we can move on. Okay, cool. So what I'll do is I'm just going to turn these lines off in the display because they're getting a little distracting. I'm looking at the grid. I'm cleaning the grid. I want to pay attention to the grid. Uh, so what I'm going to show is a couple of ways that you can differentiate between manual editing and uh, and filtering. So what I'll do is I'll just draw a little box here and I'll run the slice editor. This loads the points from that box. And what I'm gonna do, just for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to destroy all of these points. Big old lasso, kill that, hit save, and this is gonna make a big square notch in my terrain model there. And what I'll do, so that was a manual edit. I manually did that. Let's bring that same box over here and load some points. Now let's go to the filter toolbar and say, I would like to filter all sounding. So in this box, filter or remove or reject all of the soundings. When you see the word filter in here, that's what that means. It's reject all the soundings. So I've chosen that filter. I'm going to apply it here. So I've done the same thing. I've made all the soundings in this plot go away. I click save. I get another hole in my surface. So what if I'm coming back and I'm looking at someone else's work and I want to figure out, hey, what did you do that was manual? What did you do that was an automated filter? So let's grab this whole box, this whole slice of data, and there it is. You can see that where I've knocked holes in the surface here, the sharp edge is there, the sharp edge is there. And you'll see as I move my mouse around in the, in the slice editor, the closest sounding is lit up and shown in the display as a big white dot. So you can quickly get a spatial reference of where you are. Uh, so what I'll do now is in the filter toolbar, I'm going to revert all manual edits. Let's choose that, and I'm going to apply it here. What that's going to do is bring back the things that I manually edited. If I hit Save, this hole is going to get filled in now. Now there's another tool that says Revert All Filtering. This second notch that I put in here was something that I had done as a filter, and so we keep those uh, flags separate and separate bookkeeping so that I can come in, I can say, undo all of the filtering I did, click yes, save, and boom, I bring that back. But when you revert all filtering, you also undo the spline filter that we had applied earlier. So any action that's done through here as a, as a filter is setting a, a specific bit, a flag with the sounding that lets us keep separate what's done through this menu here versus what's done through a manual editing operation, either through the slice editor or the swath editor or the 3D editor. And since I don't like those spikes and I work so hard to get rid of them, let's just do a medium spline again in here and get this back surface back to where we want it to be. So there, that's just showing it quickly how you can differentiate between manual filtering and automated filtering. And then you can undo and redo to your heart's content and, and keep those separated. Um, what I'm going to do now is show how uh, what a lot of cloud users do is clip out the edges of surveys and clean up. Uh, we have a lot of line run-ins and run-outs and surveys when we do this. So what I'm going to do is choose the uh, the polygon select tool and come over here and I'm just going to, oops, that's not what I wanted. Uh, I don't actually need the slice editor for this. Let's turn it off. I'm going to click here and I'm going to cut a straight line across 
and then come over here and close the polygon. And I'm going to basically cut everything, filter all soundings inside my selection, go. And so that's going to run and update the grid in a moment. And we'll see that I've got a nice clean edge here. So this is useful for cleaning up the edges if you like. And then also if you have some wayward soundings that end up way out in space for one reason or another, you can come in and, and, and select them uh, and then make them disappear like that. So I'll do the polygon select tool again. Again, that's just a left click and then you left click on the original point to close the polygon. Let's do the same thing down here. So I can trim that and make a nice clean edge on that to remove all the run in and run out bits and pieces that I've got from the survey lines. And there we go. So that's a quick, quick and easy editing tool that cloud users have used for a long time. That's a, a welcome feature now that's in Chimera. Um, all right, so we've cleaned up the edges. And then next I wanted to look at another custom filter, which is the refraction filter. For this, I'll grab a rectangular select and I'll put it over a nice flat area up here. And I'll just resize this to be over the nice flat area. And I'm going to run the slice editor. So this loads all of the soundings in there. Let's just turn the soundings back on in the view. So if I go to the additional features menu in the slice editor and I choose show 3D soundings, that's going to plot them in the display. And the slice editor, I've got them colored by line. That's controlled with this tool here. Left click and hold down and I can color by system, by ping, beam, depth. Uh, it's very handy to color in this view by line. What I like in the spatial view is to be able to color by depth. And so if I go to the second tool here in the scene, I can color by depth, and that's what we've got already. So I'll just pop into 3D mode real quick. Hold down Shift, and I left click to rotate and get the view that I want. Okay, and there it is. So what I'm going to, do, going to do now is create a custom filter for refraction correction. There really isn't a refraction artifact to correct here, but I'll just demonstrate how you'd fix it if you wanted one, if you needed to. Refract up. I'll call this new custom filter there. And what I'll do is I'll add a filter to there. Let's just make this dialog a little bit bigger. So we see the whole list. There it is. Apply refraction correction. There's some text explaining what's going on. This is an empirical refraction correction. It's basically bending the footprints based on a sound speed offset that you can inject at a certain depth and it can have a certain value. So minus 1.0 for refracting up. And what I'll do is I'll copy this filter. I'll call this refract down. And when I say refract down, I mean if you have a smile, it will refract it down in the frown direction. A lot of people just call these smile and frown artifacts. So again, refract down has a sound velocity correction of one meter per second, refract up minus one meter per second. So I click OK. So I've made my custom filters and they're now down here in the bottom in my custom cleaning profiles. So I'm going to choose refract up. And because I'm in the slice editor view, what I can do now is I click this button. Let's make sure I'm not saving automatically or instantly. I can click this button and I can make the soundings bend to a refracted straight uh, state. Uh, let's go to auto zoom also. So if I had soundings that looked like this and I had a major refraction problem, I mean, this is a bit of an artificial example. I could choose my refract down filter and click that until the problem went away. So let's get back to normal and then let's just go a little overboard in the other direction. So I'm making big frown artifacts. So you can see that, and you can see that in context of all of the soundings. There's an additional mode you can see. Uh, you can apply, if I go to the additional features menu, uh, only do the editing to the selected file. So when I enable this, they all get grayed out. And I right click on the file set I want, select line, this lights it up. So if there's one particular file that's problematic, for example, I can choose a different filter and apply that to just that one file. Let's say I do that. And what I'll do is hit save. And this is going to make a big old ugly mess in my terrain model. Let's turn off the sounding so I can see that. And sure enough, 
it's all lumpy and bumpy, and the standard deviation, remember that we're coloring by standard deviation, is getting red in between the survey lines. If I turn them on again, uh, edit one is selected. you can see that the standard deviation is quite high in between the areas of overlap. And of course, the soundings don't agree well where there's a lot of refraction. So that's an example of how you can uh, fix refraction. Uh, the slice editor lets you get a window into how much refraction artifact you'd like to fix. If I hit save, it obviously updates the grid. If I wanted to apply this globally, I could just leave the slice editor and then refract up and then do that everywhere if I wanted to. And I won't do that now but you could. So let's turn the lines off a little bit. Uh, there's another type of corrector that you can do. This was available in cloud, which is to apply a Z shift. And what we can do is just select one of the survey lines here. I'm going to plan view. And this particular survey line, what I'm going to do is bump it up by one meter. And let's, let's say, for example, I ran the majority of these lines uh, on one day and I came and ran an infill line the next day and the tide didn't match up and I had to bump that one file up by you know, one meter. That, that's that's a, a really large example, but uh, it, it gets the point across. So I'm going to make a custom uh, filtering profile called bump up one meter. I'm going to add an operation to it. And what I want is a Z shift. So I click that. This explains what's going on there. And I'm going to just make it jump up by one meter. So that's what this filter does. I've got that filter selected. Now, just exploring this a little bit more, I've not really touched this second part. It says surfaces files. In this case, I just want to do it to the selected file, which is that one right there inside my selection. I want to do it everywhere for that file and click go. And what we'll see is that they're going to get a big red ribbon because the standard deviation is going to increase quite a bit because one of the files disagrees quite wildly with the other files. So if I go to the slice editor again, I'll see that indeed that one file is bumped up quite a bit. So if I had showed up and this was the one data file that I saw that was disagreeing with my whole data set, I can use the slice editor as a bit of a preview tool. I can see that there's a problem. I can come in here and there's a new measure tool. If I click on this. And if you watch down here in the status bar, if I left click and hold, I can measure and you'll see that this reports a Z delta of about a meter. So you can use the slice editor as a window to diagnose and figure out what do I have to do. In this case, this particular file, select a line. I can see it's this line in blue. Okay, that's line number three I, I see up here. Uh, so let's, and it needs to come down by a meter. So let's get out of the slice editor. And what we'll do is we'll make a bump down, copy this filter. bump down one meter, and this one will bring it down, minus one. And I hit OK. And again, if I'm in the slice editor, let's just see what happens there. If I apply this filter to that line, it should pop down to where it was before. And OK, that does what I want it to do. Let's get out of the slice editor. And I don't want to save my edits. I was just looking. And now I want to apply that so that I select the files everywhere, and that should pop that file back down to where it was before, and this red ribbon should go away. Oh, it didn't. Oh, I, I grabbed the wrong file. Um, okay, so I obviously made a mistake there. How do we recover from mistakes? I can get out of my selection mode, and I want to basically make a new custom prof profile, revert all Z shifts. I've created that there. And let's make this a little larger. I want to restore raw data. That's the type of filter profile I want. And I don't want to disable restore to my sounding flag state. I just want to remove the XYZ shifts I might have applied. Click yes. And now I want to file that filter to select the files to all files everywhere. And that should clean this up. So that's running there, and then we update the grid. And we should see the red ribbon go away, and then the refraction monkey business I had done should go back to what it was before. And there we have it. So you can ref you can correct for refraction or small Z shifts uh, easily with some filters. 
Uh, and if you don't like what happened, you can revert them uh, spatially or for one line or for selected areas for the whole surface. Um, so yeah, that's the end of this particular section here. So let's take a break for some questions. Uh, Duncan, any questions? Uh, there have been a few questions. Um, there have been a couple on uh, whether we support um, uh, uh, Konsberg's extra detections or the or the Reson multi detect. But um, maybe if we have time at the end, we can we can show that. I've answered that. Yes, we do support them. Sure, we do actually, uh, and that's actually one of these filters. And we do have time. I'll just quickly spin up another project. Okay. Extra. Uh, actually, we call them additional soundings in QPS because uh, the different hardware manufacturers have different names for them, so we chose one that's different. Uh, additional soundings, so I'll add a raw sonar file. So I'm a little unscripted here, hopefully this should work. I'm going to add a file. I've got some data tuck tucked away. I think I demoed that for the 1.1 release. Yeah, the 1.1 release we did November 18th last year supported extra detections and multi-detect from Kongsberg and Reson. So here's a Kongsberg file, uh, .all file. Uh, it's prompting, prompting me to make a surface. I'll bring that in, hit OK. There we go. So here's a shipwreck. Let's just look at that 3D. Oopsie. There it is. And shipwrecks, uh, I find the vertical exaggeration. Default of 6 is a little, uh, a little silly. So I bring that back down to 1. And I can see the shipwreck there. And... Uh, as part of the new filters, uh, let's just go to plan view and turn off my survey line. I don't want to see that. It's just distracting me. What I can do is draw a polygon around the shipwreck. And I'm going to use an additional capability that's above and beyond what uh, cloud supported. There's two new built-in filters. There's one to accept addi additional soundings and one to reject. And uh, until the, the hardware manufacturers have very, very robust extra detections and uh, multi-detect where they don't track as much noise as they do currently, usually people don't want that to be on all the time. So we're encouraging people to only use it when you need it. And if you have a target of interest, you can circle it, like I've done with this polygon here. And I'm going to accept all additional soundings that are in there. So I'm just basically going to turn them on. So for all files uh, in my surface, inside the selection, go that brings back all of the additional soundings in there. And what I'll do is I'm going to reject any outside of there. If this is a hydrographic uh, job, I don't care about the seafloor around it. This is, I did one pass over this wrecked, wreck. So I've chosen to reject additional soundings. I go to outside selection and I click apply. And then some of the fuzz that was out here went away. So we've thrown away some of the soundings. So that's a quick way to get at it. Uh, and if you want to look at it, you can uh, jump in the slice editor. And what I'll do is, if you're in the slice editor mode, make the dots a little bigger. The blue dots are the additional soundings, and the purple dots are the regular soundings. So we can see all of the ones that came uh, as additional soundings. And again, if I want to reject them, let's do that in here. All those blue dots went away. If I want to accept them, accept additional soundings there. I can bring them back. And so you can see if I really zoom in here, you get more detail uh, in the ribbing. I wonder if I can change the color mode to by depth maybe. There we go. So the blue dots are the additional soundings that came back. Again, if I reject them, you see all the bits and pieces of the extra infrastructure, the, the ship structure is being picked up. If I reject them, that goes away. If I accept them, they come back. And we might be particularly interested, if I'm a hydrographer, looking at the shoalless point here, uh, whether there were additional soundings. And it doesn't seem that there were any. So yeah, that, that's a quick way to do that. I think we can cover that more in a, a follow-up video posted on YouTube. Uh, any other questions, Duncan? Uh, no, I think um, uh, there was one question about uh, canceling our editing in the process history window, but then I thought, well, that's you can do it using the restore raw data, but uh, maybe it's actually just to press cancel when you're actually doing the filter, and that that should work. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that, that's um, that's all at the moment. 
There we go. So I went off script and I caused a crash. <laughs> oh well. I like going off script though. You answer the questions people have. Um, okay, so let's get to the third part, the last part. So I'll show off some of the other capability that we've got built into this release. Let's turn the survey lines on. Um, what I'm going to show is the new scroll editor mode. And that's also something that came from cloud. Actually, I need the lines off for this. And that's a new tool that's in the toolbar here. It's a new spatial selection mode. I'm going to click that. And what happens is when I left click and drag, I get to draw a box the size I like. When I let go, I now get to orient the box in the direction I like. And this little dashed line poking out, if I left click and then left click again and left click again and left click again and then right click, lets me define a path that I want to review data along. And then you can use the usual keyboard shortcuts, the W and S to move forward. There's a new control movement control toolbar that we'll cover in a minute that lets you, uh, lets you control the movement. And so what I'll do is I'll just do that exact thing. Let's, let's go with this scenario where I'm reviewing the data for this particular data set. Let's draw a path. So left click, left click, left click, left, left, left. I'm off the screen. If I middle mouse, I can reposition left click, left click, and then right click to stop it. And we'll jump into slice editing mode. And that'll load the points there. Let's draw them in the scene as well. Show 3D soundings. And so I can see them in the scene. Uh, I'm going to just reduce the size of the points in the scene to medium so I can start to see a little more detail. And what we can do now is, is walk through this data set along a prescribed path. And again, I'm going to turn the coloring here to color by line. And I see the different colors for the different survey lines in the slice editor. But up in the scene, I have a color by depth still. So I can walk along with the W key. I can move backwards with the S key. These are the new ergonomic gamer keys that we put in with the 1.2 release. And that lets you keep your left hand on the mouse and your right hand on the keyboard. And what you can do is walk along and then do some dot killing if you like. I'm just going to do some silly things, remove some dots move along, hit save. I want my updates to happen instantly. I'm going to save edits instantly here. That way when I kill a dot, it's automatically updated in the surface. So you can walk along the prescribed line. There's a couple other things you can do. Uh, I'll look at the movement toolbar. This is a new toolbar that came from cloud. This lets you walk back and forth along a path. So here I'm going to jump to the beginning of the file, here to the end. There it is there. So the beginning, let's zoom in, and I can step along one step at a time. What I can also do is just hit play. And so, I mean, you can't see me because I'm not showing my video. If I change this to one second, this is going to just move that box automatically along that path for me at a one second interval. And I have my hands off. I'm not doing it. I'm watching. And if I've got mostly clean data, but my job is to make sure that it's all clean, I can sit back and watch. And this is playing for me. It's just like doing side scan review in some software applications. If I see a problem, I hit the space bar and stop it. Oopsie, I lost my focus there. Space bar to stop. And then I can come in and kill some dots if I like. And deal with the problem. Once I'm happy with it, I hit play again. And this is capability that came from cloud that people have requested that we put in Chimera as well. So you can basically, if you've got mostly clean data and you just need to scan through it systematically, you can use this mode uh, to do that. And this isn't just isolated to the uh, scroll box mode. I can do, uh, let's just jump out of there. I can do any old spatial selection and load the slice editor and hit play and it'll advance in the direction that the arrow is pointing. So I could do it this way if I like, or with the scroll box. So if you've got mostly clean data, but your job is to systematically go through it scan by scan to make sure it's clean, you can do that. Uh, we've had some clients tell us that they've even got protocols that you shouldn't have a slice box that has a certain size and dimension. So in the far left of the movement toolbar, you, there's a, a cogs button. You can adjust the selection geometry. And let's just move this over here so we can see what's going on. I can say, maybe my protocol says I must have a slice box that's 100 meters wide, and it's never wider than 5 meters in the short dimension. And if I wanted to, I could rotate it here 45 degrees. Of course, you can, you can rotate that all graphically, but here you can hard code the size of the box. 
and then hit play. And it just marches along the path. And what's interesting, what I haven't paid a lot of attention to yet in this webinar is the surface edit overview. This is keeping track of the path that you've reviewed. If I hit pause and come back and knock a big hole in it, I can see that the grid updates, but what I can see in here is that, hey, that's red now. I've actually edited an area and that shows up differently. So the white overlay shows where you've seen, the red shows where you've done an edit. And if I proceed, you'll see that it keeps sweeping out that area. So that I can keep track of the areas that I've seen and visited in a, in a semi-automated semi way if I need to. Um, there's a couple of new edit modes uh, that are in here. What I'll do is uh, just switch to the polygon select for the lasso and I'll go into 3D and we have about nine minutes left so some time for this. There's a lump here and let's say this is a feature of interest that uh, I might be looking for. Let's first of all get rid of that spike that's making, making me crazy. Medium spline. Okay, that's gone, thank you. Uh, let's go over here. And I see this lump here on the seafloor. Maybe this is a, a navigable waterway and I'm quite interested in knowing what this lump is. Maybe I wanna mark it up as a feature for future inspection. So there's a new uh, feature on the slice editing toolbar here. And it's this drop down menu or combo box, some people call it. Normal edit is what's the default and that lets me do things like kill dots. And if I come here, I can accept and reject. Uh, what I'm going to turn, I'll do is turn off my instant edits. And uh, what I'm going to do is switch to select and edit. Normal edit has an immediate action. You're either rejecting or accepting. When you switch to select and edit mode, what you're doing is you're selecting and it lights it up with little blue crosshairs. And now you're deciding what you want to do with it. And how you decide that is you right click in here and you get this menu. I can clear my selection, I can invert my selection, which means choose the things that are unselected. Let's get back to where I was. Uh, I can select by certain flags. Show me anything that was rejected by uh, the filter, for example. Uh, nothing in this view. Uh, what I want to do, oops, I lost my selection. Right click. What I'm going to do for this example is I'm going to set the feature flag. So this is a particular sounding flag we keep. And now if I hit save, deep down in the QPD, those particular soundings have been marked as features. And that's interesting. Uh, it's kind of neat that I've done that. But what I can do now is to keep track of that. Let's turn off my soundings in the 3D view. Go back to my project layer. The dynamic surface, I can highlight by the feature flag. And now I'm going to draw the scene with the usual color map, but anything that's been marked as a feature has this special coloring. So I can mark features that you know I can come by and later on review. And the different flags we have are feature, plotted, and suspect. And these come from the FM Hydro workflow that came with the Flatermouse suite. What I'm going to do is uh, show another way. I'm going to say right click and select by feature flag. That means of all the soundings, select the ones that have the feature flag set. And what I'm going to do is clear the feature flag. Let's set that back to where it was before they were features. And I hit save. The soundings are updated and the dynamic surface no longer highlights that as a feature. So that's the select and edit mode. You can also do something if you're hydrography, you want the shoalless one here, you right click and uh, select by shoalless. And the, the shoalless sounding in this particular set is lit up and what you can do is then now I want to set that as a feature flag. For that, so that's a way you can keep track of soundings over recs and, and other things like that. Um, so that's that particular editing mode. We've got a few minutes left. There's another editing mode, which is the fixed area edit. And that's best shown off with the, uh, the scroll line. So let's go back to our surface and let's get a little bit more screen space so we see what's going on. We see over here on the northern bank of this particular survey area, there are a lot of weird red spikes, and all that is is if I just grab a polygon full of them and load that in the slice editor, those are soundings that are running up a wall. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, let's just go to the slice editor. We want to clip those out, and you can use the fixed area edit to do that quite handily. So I'm going to use the scroll box select, 
and I'm going to left click here and draw my box, maybe make it that wide. And when I let go, I get the ability to draw the line. So let's go over here and I'm going to draw a line that runs right, right along the wall. I want to go as close to the wall as I can and I left click to stop come back here and let's zoom in and make this box just a little bit bigger, bigger. And let's run the slice editor. Click that. My soundings get loaded up and sure enough, there's the wall. So in fixed area edit, what this means is when I click a selection mode, I'm rejecting inside a rectangle. This box is going to stay here. And as I move back and forth with the W and the S key or with the movement boxes, anything that falls inside that box is going to be rejected. So this is a tool for a particular kind of job. In this particular job, this is an example, I want to cut that wall away all the time. In fact, I expect the wall to get quite a bit taller. So I'm going to draw a rectangle like that, and I'm going to turn my auto zoom off. Hit the home button. And now when I walk through, it's going to pre-filter everything that falls inside that box. It's basically shaving everything there. So I can do this by hand here. I'm just hitting the W key to advance through the wall. So this is a bit of a silly example. I'm cutting out a wall. Uh, and other, people, uh, other sorts of uses for this, so if you're doing pipeline surveys and you've got seabed and then there's a pipe and you really only care about the pipe, you could draw a polygon around the pipe and says, uh, for example, uh, reject outside of the rectangle, which would have the opposite effect. So if I do this, now the red shows the area that will be rejected, and as I march along, it's cutting everything outside of that rectangle. So that's those, these are the three new uh, editing modes that are in the slice editor now. And what I'll do is just get over there. JB, can you, um, whilst you're in that mode, can you show how you can click on a survey line, which could also be a DXF line or whatever to use a non use a defined line to do to do that. Oh sure, the slice okay scroll box. We got like two minutes left. That's the usual scroll box. If I turn my survey lines on, let's go to plan view. So that's the scroll box. If I just hit control button and then left click, it'll scroll box along that line and that locks to the line. So now I can use that as, as a reference line to scroll along as well. We're going to run out of time here. I'll show very, very quickly the profiling tool. So the right click gives you the standard Flatermus profile. Uh, the look and feel has changed. The release notes explain it. There's a new multi-segment profile tool. So if I left click and then right click, sorry, left, 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 and right, I can get multiple segments along. And uh, what's also new is that if I make another surface, uh, I think I can do this quickly here. I'm going to make a static surface. This basically takes a snapshot of that dynamic surface. Let's just turn it off from the visibility. And what I'll do is go into the polygon select. I'm going to make a, a big, big bump, one meter bump in that selection. So my dynamic surface now has a big bump in it that you can see. And what I've also got is the original surface, so let's make another surface object. This is the after. And I'll turn off the dynamic surface and I'll turn on the two surface objects. So if I s select those and I use the flicker mode, which is the, uh, the tilde key, I can see the difference between those two surfaces. The profiling tool now, if I go here and I have my surfaces selected, I get profiles across multiple surfaces now. So if I have the, the surfaces visible in the scene and that's controlled with the tick box, when I profile now, I get profiles across multiple surfaces. So you see here one in blue, that's the one called surface object. The one in green is called after. As I move my profile along, my mouse in the window, I get a little red ball that also displays in the scene up, up here, for example. That helps me visually correlate where features are. And so that's the new multi-segment profiling tool and it's multi-surface. And then of course you can export this as an image. Image A, and if I hit Control F, that always opens your project directory. If I go to the export directory, there's that image. 
So that's ready for a report right there. You can also export this as ASCII and do whatever you like with it in other tools. So that pretty much covers everything we wanted to cover.